If you have been watching some of the wild footage coming from Ukraine lately, then you no doubt are aware of how dangerous all of the shoulder-fired and short-range air defense weapons have become in recent years. With the German Gepard shooting down Iranian drones in an effort of six shots, and shoulder-fired SAMs destroying incoming Russian cruise missiles, it is an amazing spectacle to watch. Short-range air defense, or SHORAD systems, have come a long way over the years, especially since the 1960s. It wasn't that long ago that infantry would have little more than their rifles or heavy machine guns to try and fend off air attacks. For larger units and fixed installations, you would have a wide assortment of anti-aircraft artillery pieces and gun emplacements, but for the most part it was just bigger guns and heavier firepower than troops on the ground would normally have. Rudimentary sights on the weapons would be the gunner's only way to try and score a hit. With the invention of the proximity fuse, now anti-aircraft artillery, or AAA, had a way to be able to get the tremendous power of the high explosive rounds to still take down an aircraft without having to score a direct hit, or get the timing right just to explode at the correct altitude. But the guidance was still essentially guesstimation of the aim point. With the advent of radar equipped guns, there was now a way to more accurately aim the guns, which was needed as jet aircraft and their speed made it very difficult for gunners on the ground to provide the lead time needed for a hit. But this only really helped with fixed positions or with larger ground units. The soldiers on the ground still had little more than their rifles to try and defend against air attacks, and those would do very little against jets flying high above and out of range. In the 1950s, a competition was held in the U.S. to create a man-portable or man-pad weapon capable of firing an infrared or heat-seeking guided missile against enemy aircraft. The eventual winner of the competition was to be known as the FIM-43 Red Eye. The Red Eye had a lot of problems, including not being able to target an aircraft head-on, instead waiting until the aircraft was heading away in what is called a tail chaser seeker. It was still only a first generation weapon. And while the weapon itself wasn't that effective, it was still much better for ground troops than their rifles or crew serve heavy machine guns they carried with them. The Soviets too realized that a shoulder fired missile would be needed in the modern combat environment that was evolving. And with much of the details of the Red Eye available publicly, they set out about making their own manpad the Strela II, named the SA-7 Grail by NATO. Now some of you may hear the name Strela and associate it with these two vehicle mounted systems. The SA-9 Gaskin mounted on a BRDM-2, or the SA-13 Gopher mounted on an MTLB. And while they are named Strela by the Soviets and the Russians, they are not the same missile. The SA-9 is known as the Strela-1. The Strela-1 is much larger with double the size of the warhead, and is a far more dangerous system to deal with. The SA-13 uses the updated version of the Strela-1, known as the Strela-10. Now for people that watch this channel, you probably are thinking that this is the point where I start playing the old Soviet anthem and start talking about how bad the SA-7 is and how it was such a failure on the battlefield. And while yes, it wasn't that good of a weapon, like the Red Eye, it was only a first generation weapon. And on top of that, it did have many battlefield successes before it was updated to more modern variants further down the road. So no, this isn't me trying to say how bad the SA-7 is. It actually has a fairly decent target hit ratio for first generation systems. It was slightly more successful than the earlier American Red Eye. The title for Worst Manpad goes to another. It belongs to those plucky and determined chaps across the pond the Brits, and the horrendously bad manpad known simply as the Blowpipe. This system is probably one of the worst weapon systems that was ever put into full-scale production. When the Mujahideen complained about how bad the system was, the British simply wrote it off that the training of the shooters was very poor and that a better trained gunner would be more effective. Then those same poorly trained gunners received American Stinger missiles and began taking down Russian jets and helicopters with relative ease. The missiles were so maligned by the British troops that the British quickly purchased Stinger missiles for their own troops to use during the Falklands campaign. And while both the British and the Argentine forces both had the Lotus pipe missile in their inventory, 
they both can only claim one hit on either side, and these against slow-moving helicopters or scout aircraft and little else. Some years later, during the Sanepa War between Peru and Ecuador, while both sides claim success, none of these can be confirmed. With all of this and the more than 100 firings of the missile, there are only 11 probable kills with only one confirmed, that of an Argentine Navy Aramaki 339. This leads to a fire-to-hit probability of 10%, that after further investigating might have a fire-to-kill rate of less than 1%. So why is the blowpipe missile so bad? Well, to answer that question, we need to go all the way to the design and development of the weapon. A weapon that wasn't even requested by the British early on, but Shorts, the company that created it, had already started development before the British wanted it, making themselves the only solution for the problem when the British finally did request a manpad system for their troops. Shorts set out to try and create a low-cost system. This meant that a new approach had to be taken in making the missile. With the infrared seeker head deemed too expensive, a radio guidance system was fitted to the missile instead. This meant that the system could be fired regardless of heat emissions or the seeker's ability to detect them. It also meant that countermeasures such as flares would not be able to decoy the missile. Instead, the gunner, looking through a reticle on the launch unit, would use a thumb toggle to guide the missile onto the target. Sounds pretty simple, doesn't it? The missile also had a very awkward design. The missile tube looks very much like the mouthpiece for a trumpet, with a flared end at the head of the missile that tapers off to the exhaust port at the back. The reason for this was that Shorts determined that it would cost less to not have folding fins at the front of the missile. This would make the profile larger, but would in theory allow stationary fins at the front and lower cost per missile. In reality, it was a quality control issue as Shorts was having reliability issues with the folding fins during, de during development. A radio cassette that doesn't work. It's got cruise control that doesn't work. Okay, so the missile is a bit ugly to look at and doesn't have the same seeker head that the Americans or the Soviets are using for their man pads. But that seeker can't be decoyed and can be independently guided by the gunner. What's so bad about that? Oh, and the Russians set fire to the Kuznetsov again. So the problems with the Seeker initially was that while the theory of a gunner guiding the missile to the target sounds good, in practice this only really worked against slow-moving targets such as tanks or trucks on the ground, not helicopters or combat aircraft that travel much faster. This approach also means that the gunner must remain exposed and stationary from firing to guide the weapon onto the target. I've tried this system through a mod in Arma 3, and I could only get a hit if the target was a hovering helicopter. If the target is flying across your path, you stand very little chance of scoring a hit. This compared to the SA-7, which could be easy, easily decoyed by flares, yet still could make hits against moving targets. Or the Stinger, which had a good chance of scoring a kill against a moving target firing flares as well. In practice, this system was just a nightmare for the troops that were meant to fire it. The British, not wanting to waste money on live fire training, instead limited the gunners to one or two test shots at most before they were deemed qualified. During the 1991 Gulf War, the Canadians brought the blowpipe with them for air defense. Of the 27 missiles fired, nine of them, a full third of the tests, the missile misfired. The Canadians quickly made an emergency order and replaced the blowpipes with the backward compatible and much more advanced Javelin GL. This is not to be confused with the American anti-tank missile known by the same name. Alright, so the blowpipe had some problems. It was plagued by misfires and it was a nightmare to score a hit with. But it was better than their rifles and other weapons, right? Well, that is where it gets more interesting. The blowpipe utilized a radio control system to guide the missile into the target. Unlike many anti-tank guided systems of the time period, which used wire guidance, radio frequencies can be jammed. Even worse was that the radio frequency being used could be detected by the radar warning receivers, or RWR, that were already standard on frontline Soviet and Warsaw Pact combat aircraft since the early 1970s. This meant that the Soviet aircraft, like the Mi-8 HIP or the Mi-24 Hind, the kind being targeted in Afghanistan, would have an early warning when one of these was active and could take evasive maneuvers to avoid a hit. 
Even worse was the advent of electronic warfare jammer pods on Soviet aircraft that would effectively, effectively jam the radio guidance of the blowpipe, making them useless against Soviet aircraft. So let me break down how bad this was. The missile was difficult to aim and control for a hit. It was prone to misfires and malfunctions. All Soviet combat aircraft could detect its presence, and in ma many cases, they could also make it unguidable due to jamming. But that's not all. The system, billed as a low-cost alternative to systems like the Stinger, cost around $160,000 in 1994, compared to the $35,000 cost for the much more effective Stinger missile. Speaking of cost, producing these videos is not as simple as grabbing footage and taping it together. It takes a lot of time and effort for me to create them. If you like these videos, show your support by hitting that like button, subscribing to the channel, and sharing it with your friends on social media. We have grown quite a lot in the past few months, and the only way I know it is worth it is if you, the viewers, tell me you enjoy it. Those likes, comments, and subscriptions also tell YouTube to recommend this channel to a wider audience. So if you are tired like I am of these videos really not getting seen by more people, then you know what to do. Want to go a step above? Then consider becoming a member of our Patreon like these people did and help us grow in this new year.